Hello everyone, and welcome back to another GIS lecture video. And in this GIS lecture video, what I want to do is I want to continue our discussion of the vector data model by dipping into this idea of the components of the vector data model by finalizing our discussion of the first component, which is geometry. And so we've really been talking about the geometry all along without explicitly stating it that way. Right, because the geometry is the coordinates, right? The point for the point data, the, the lines for line data, or the polygons for polygon data, right? That those those sets of coordinates that makes up the geometry. But what I want to do in this video is I want to sort of wrap up this concept by talking about what we gain from the different types of geometry and when you might choose one over the other and then talk about this idea of multi-part versus single part vector data. So let's go ahead and scroll down to give ourselves a little bit of space here. All right. So what I want to do in this video is talk about benefits of different vector types right how to choose which vector type And then this idea of multi-part versus single part. Vectors. All right, so let's talk about the, the benefits of the different vector types. So just to recap, right, we have points, we have lines, and we have polygons, okay? And so what I want to do is I want to quickly diagram out Right, points, right, we have lines, and we have polygons. Right. And so what do we get and gain in terms of benefit of going between one and the other? Well, let's start off with points, right? What, what information does points give us? Well, points or point vector data is an example of what's called a 0D or a zero dimension data. All right. So with point data, what we get is just location. Right, so the only benefit or, or information that we get from the point data is just the location. Right? That's the only thing we have is one coordinate, hence why it's 0D. And the only thing that we can that we get in addition to the location of it is just the location. That's all we get. Right. 
if we think about lines, right, lines are what are called 1D or one dimensional data. Right, and if you think back to, this is coming from sort of high school algebra and geometry, right? Lines are one dimensional, right? They have a length, but no width. And so with line data, not only do we get the location of all of the nodes, right? The vertices that make up the line, but we also get, right, as a, as a benefit, right? Let me put this down here, right? We also, get length, right? So if we represent something with a linear vector type, right? By virtue of the way that we construct it, we're able to get length or get the length, right? Of whatever that object is by virtue just of the geometry, not any attributes, not any additional information that we're bringing in, just by virtue of the fact that we have more than one coordinate, we can calculate the length of that object. So let's talk about polygons for a second. Um, again, if we think back to basic geometry, right, polygons are representative of 2D or two-dimensional data. Or two-dimensional data. Right, and if you think back to, again, geometry, right, what do you get when you have a polygon? Well, you can calculate the length of all of the sides, so we can get the perimeter. Right, so we have the perimeter. But we also have the ability to calculate the area. Right? So if we store the data in a polygon geometry, so we choose a polygon vector type, right? We can calculate the area of whatever we're representing, right? So for example, imagine that we have a building footprint, right? So we've gone around the base of the building and we've calculated the building footprint, right? You would be able to calculate how much square footage or area, right, the base of that building is going to take up relative to the surrounding landscape. Okay. Now, we haven't really talked about it, but it is possible for GIS to transition from polygons to volumes. Um, so it would be 3D data, and then you would also be able to get the volume. Um, but that's kind of outside the scope of this particular course. Um, but it is possible to sort of continue this trend into three dimensions. But by and large, most data we're going to be dealing with is going to fall in either zero, so we get the location, two, we get the location and the length, or three, we get polygons, which gives us the locations, the perimeters, and the area. So hopefully this all makes sense. So let's go ahead and talk about how we actually choose which type of data or which which geometry type to go with. So <clears throat> this decision, right, is going to be based on really two things. Right, two things to consider when choosing a vector data type. Right, one is going to be the underlying feature. Right. And what I mean by this is if you think it through logically, right, if you're measure, if you're trying to do something like, say, the boundaries of a state, right, you're not going to make states be represented by points, at least not under normal circumstances. Right. 
Again, thinking back to the idea of a fire hydrant, right? Under most circumstances, a fire hydrant is a single singular location. You'd represent it by a single coordinate pair. Single coordinate pairs are, by definition, point vector types, right? And as again, we, we saw with like rivers and, and, and roads and things, right? The first logical step might be, okay, we're gonna represent those as lines. Right, so spending some time considering the underlying feature, right? So thinking about, you know, what geometry best represents the real world feature. The real world object slash phenomena. Right, spending some time thinking about that is going to give you sort of the first indication of what you should be considering, right? If you can just completely disregard entirely one or more of the, of the three types, that can help make the decision much easier. So that's the first thing to consider, right? Which geometry most strongly aligns or geometries most strongly align with the actual thing that you're trying to map. So again, right, fire hydrants almost always going to be some sort of um, some sort of vector data or point vector data. So the second thing to consider, and we're going to talk a lot more about scale in future in future modules, but the second is right what is the scale of the final map, right? At the end of the day, how zoomed in, right? So another, another way to think of scale is zoomed. Right, zoomed in or out, and we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> It is zoom scale is a lot more complicated than simply zooming in and zooming out, but at a high level, right? We can think of it as how zoomed in or how zoomed out are we going to be, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually pull up a Google Google Maps for a second, and I want you to just think through conceptually how the sort of underlying features change as we zoom in and out. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a portion of the Seaford Oyster Bay Expressway and a very small portion of Bethpage State Park. And what I want you to think through here is watch what happens to this here and the Bethpage State Park as we zoom out. And I want you to think through logically how in this case, right, this line here, or this this road, right, you might be able to justify here at this particular zoom level, and if I zoom in even more, right, you might be able to justify drawing this as a polygon, right, where we would have a point here, a point here, a point here, a point here, and then close the loop, right, that might make sense at this level, but watch what happens as we zoom out. right it becomes much 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 harder to do that right so at a, 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 a detailed right if i zoom back in right when it's really zoomed in like this it might make sense to incorporate the width or the area of a certain type of feature right rivers are another good example of this right it might make sense to have these drawn like this Right, draw all, have this drawn as a polygon. But as we zoom out, right, it may make more sense to just have them as points along a line and have them be used as lines. Right, the same thing if we, if we zoom in a little bit, right, on this golf course, right, this country club. Right, so right now we have it represented 
as a green polygon, okay? And we have some different buildings as points. Now imagine if we zoom out and we zoom out and we zoom out and we zoom out, right? Suddenly that polygon disappears, right? We zoom in a little bit, right? The polygon's there again. So as we zoom out, right, it begins to make less and less and less sense to represent that country club as a polygon. And it starts to make more and more and more sense to represent it as a simple point with the sort of central location being represented rather than a polygon delineating all the boundaries. So again, I'm going to zoom in, right? It makes sense to have all of this detail of all of the, the boundary pieces as a polygon, but as we zoom out, it becomes harder and harder and harder and less and less relevant to delineate those features. So at some point it might make sense to say, okay, I've zoomed out. I'm so far zoomed out. I'm going to represent this. I'm going to represent that particular country club as a point, And I'm going to represent the roads as lines as opposed to saying, hey, I'm going to represent town line road here as a polygon. And the country club is a polygon because we're so far in, we can see, right, the detail becomes more relevant. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's go ahead and switch back over to our um, notes here, right? So what scale are we going to be working at, right? And so, or to put this, to put this another way, right, what level of detail is required, right? Does it make sense to have the full detail of a polygon or is it basically just at the level that we're working at going to consolidate down in and be better off just being represented as a point or for, or for roads and rivers and things like that? Does it make sense to have the width incorporated as a polygon or does it make more sense to just represent it as a line, right? Again, just to, to clarify here, right? Right? Road polygon versus road line. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, who cares the polygon versus the line? But you also have to realize, right, this has two vertices. This has one, two, three, four, five vertices. So this requires more computer power to store and draw, right? So using a lower level, right? So going from a polygon to a line or from a line to a point, right? That's going to save on computational power. And if it's not necessary to have all of these vertices, don't, right? So think about, right, what the feature is. Does it make sense to do something beyond the point? And think about, right, what level of detail is actually required based on the zoom or the scale, to use the geographic term, of the final map. Are we going to be zoomed out so far that these two things are indistinguishable from each other? If they are, just use a line, right? If a polygon is going to be zoomed out so far that a point would get the job across, just use the point. Right? Because otherwise you're wasting computational power to store and draw these things. So hopefully that makes sense. I want to, you know what, actually, let's go ahead and make the multi-part versus single part a separate video. So let's go ahead and end this video here so that you can take a second, think back through, especially dealing with, you know, how do we pick the best data type? And how do we justify that choice? And then the next video, we'll talk about single part versus multi-part. So 
If you have any questions, as always, please reach out. Thank you.